Welcome and thank you for joining part one of CIFAR's Commercial Litigation Outlook webinar series, Insights and Predictions for Litigation Trends in 2023. All participants are in listen-only mode. You are encouraged to submit questions throughout the program using the Q&A section located on the right side of your WebEx window. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions. Any unanswered questions will be followed up by email after the webinar. For those interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation. Please write this code down. It will not be repeated and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and presentation materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Sean Wood. Sean, you may begin. Thank you, Sadie. My name is Sean Wood, and I share the Commercial Litigation Practice Group at CIFAR Shaw, along with my co-chair, Rebecca Wood. We want to welcome everyone to our Commercial Litigation Outlook 2023. This is part one of an annual program where we analyze current trends and forecast what we expect to see in the coming year in key areas of commercial litigation. We've received tremendous feedback uh, in connection with this program, and one suggestion we've uh, had after prior year's presentations is that we move very quickly uh, through a large number of areas. And so this year, we've broken up the program into <clears throat> three separate webinars to allow each speaker a better opportunity to cover uh, and do a deeper dive into key topics. To kick off this year's program, our first speaker is Chris Robertson. Chris is a partner in our Boston office whose practice is focused in securities and fiduciary litigation. Chris also chairs our national whistleblower team and he'll be reporting out from the trenches in providing his 2023 trial outlook. Thanks, Sean. Much appreciated. We can go to the next slide. Um, so hopefully people had a chance to review the uh, written material that we put out um, in advance of the seminar. But if you haven't, I'll cover a few of those topics today. Um, obviously, the last couple of years have been um, a bit of a, a educational experience for all of us uh, on both sides of the bench. Um, and you know, judges have had to get used to the idea that. Uh, for a while, they couldn't have anyone in their courtrooms and then figuring out really where we are now, which is essentially a hybrid type structure. I mean, what we're seeing um, in terms of practices and in terms of preferences, a lot of this is practice, some of it's preference, and then I'll speak briefly about some actual legislative uh, items uh, where certain legislatures have specifically required certain remote access uh, to be provided. But in general, what we're seeing is, is a court by court, uh, case by case uh, approach to some of this uh, with regard to how to actually put on a trial. Um, what we are seeing is that a lot of preliminary proceedings are, are remote, um, that I think judges and lawyers all agree uh, that for a 15 minute status conference, the idea that you need to get your car and drive two hours uh, and then get in your car and drive back two hours didn't make a lot of sense. Um, so part of what I think what we're seeing is this idea of how are we gonna allocate what types of uh, proceedings should be in person, what types of proceedings can be remote and figuring out you know, how often does that face-to-face -face contact with the courts and with the lawyers um, and potentially the parties uh, how much of that is necessary in terms of the process? Um, as we noted in the in the um, uh, outlook written materials, the certain judges, um, and without casting any disparagement, some older judges, but also some younger judges, uh, have indicated that they are looking to get back to kind of what they viewed as normal pre-pandemic proceedings. But that seems to be the exception, not the rule. And this hybrid format seems to be what is going to take carry the day, at least in terms of preliminary proceedings. As to trials themselves, um, there are a few sort of innovations, I think, that even pre-pandemic had been sort of on the horizon that we're now seeing, in some sense, just feeling like they're more standard. So things that maybe five years ago we looked at would have seemed sort of revolutionary. Um, have been kind of accelerated almost into a place where now people feel they're almost sort of a given. For example, remote witness testimony in court 
just as a purely personal story, you know, I had a case years ago where we had lengthy motion practice over whether a witness could appear out of the jurisdiction remotely by video uh, in a case in Delaware. And ultimately the witness appeared and, and all of us were sort of marveling at the technology and the fact that it really felt like the person was right in the courtroom. Um, now we sort of take all this for granted. We're so used to a Zoom platform. We're so used to remote platforms and remote appearances. And I think the big difference is the visual component of that. So, you know, we used to have telephonic conferences, but the fact that you now have visual appearances, both in court, you can see the judge, you know, a lot of the concerns over, you know, is this going to work, seem to almost have settled into sort of normalcy. Um, the other thing that we've seen is, even as it comes to trials and even jury trials, is there a mechanism to make it more efficient? Um, we understand from, you know, a lot of witnesses, a lot of jurors, uh, the, the lawyers less so and the judges less so, this is our job. This is what we do every day. Um, we're prepared and we understand when we, you know, when we have a trial that, you know, we may have to make appearances. But your typical juror or a witness, <clears throat> there are real inconveniences with that. And what a lot of the surveys have shown is that, you know, by allowing a more even remote jury selection, or even though maybe they have to come in person for the actual trial, you get a broader uh, jury pool. You get a broader uh, swath of people that are now part of that process. Um, you have a better ability to sort of uh, diversify among your jurors, not just diversity in terms of ethnicity or gender, but diversity in terms of geography. Um, as many of us know, you know, the typical federal district may include everything from an urban area to suburban to even more rural areas. Um, and you typically had a jury pool in a large district that would tend to be centered on more urban and it was harder to get people from remote areas to actually appear or they had more complex. So some of the surveys have said that that's less of an issue when you're allowing at least some of it, if not all of it to be remote. So we're seeing that kind of mix of different, <clears throat> different constituencies, if you will. And we're seeing lawyers have a better ability to uh, commit to having witnesses appear if they can appear remotely. Um, I had a case just the other day that I was convinced would be in person and it turns out everyone agreed that we could do it remotely. Uh, not a jury trial, but a bench trial. So, you know, I think a lot of this is again, personal preference and kind of negotiating with your opponent about whether uh, functionally it makes sense to try to do this at least in part, if not entirely remotely. Um, and lastly, and then I'll <clears throat> hand over the program um, and I know there'll probably be some questions at the end. Um, I think, a lot of this is thinking about it early in the process, uh, understanding what your case is, understanding what the evidence is going to be uh, early, because it may be that uh, a certain type of case was where your witnesses are, or if it's truly a local case, maybe putting on that case, having your witnesses is not going to be difficult to do it in person. But there may be other cases on a federal platform, on a footprint, or even international witnesses that may warrant earlier on in the process, advising the court, being upfront about it, that this is a case where we think pieces of this will have to be done remotely. Obviously a jury trial is more complicated because a jury trial, the assumption is gonna be the jury's gonna sit, they're gonna hear the entire case, the case is gonna be given to them, they're gonna come back with a verdict. Obviously different types of proceedings can have, you know, more flexibility in that process. And again, there can be pieces of it that are in person, pieces of it that are remote, but thinking about these things early uh, is hugely important and, and sort of embedding those in the, in the documents that you give to the courts, the court understands sort of technologically and logistically what it needs to do. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. I'll give back some time, um, you know, please review the materials and, and you can always reach out to us if anyone has any questions. Um, thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Sean. Thank you, Chris. I, I had just one quick follow-up, which, you know, when, uh, in light of some of the perks you talked about that you might get a broader jury pool, uh, what have the studies show so far? I know it's pretty early in the game for meaningful studies, but in terms of, uh, the size of jury, jury verdicts, uh, when, uh, or any 
verdicts when the trial is conducted uh, remotely or in a hybrid way. Is, is there clear trends? Or, I mean, the early ones I know in California, there were some high verdicts that were surprising and people questioned, you know, were people paying attention and uh, some of those uh, obstacles you might face with a, with a remote pool. But w what are the studies showing so far on that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, that is one of the things we highlighted in the materials is that, um, you know, juries, the, the biggest issue and the biggest concern is when you bring a jury into a courtroom, there's a certain formality to it. There's a certain, you know, we've all walked into a courtroom and you immediately sort of just physically and emotionally and mentally are in a different place and you're confined. You're actually putting these people together. Whereas when you're remote, even though we all try, we all know that when we're remote, you know, we look at our phone or we're distracted or the cat or the dog or the kids run through the room or whatever. And as much as courts have tried to isolate and say, find a space, find a place where you can just be you as if we were in a courtroom. The studies are showing that that sort of formality is a bit lost. Now, whether that translated to aberrational verdicts in those cases, and I'm familiar with those, Sean, it, it, I, think, I think we don't know yet, but that is certainly a concern that certain judges have expressed is that they feel a little less in control of the lawyers, the witnesses and the jury because they're not in that sort of formal, you know, they didn't have to go through security to get in there and they are seated and there's formal breaks, you know, and then they have that time where they're actually collectively maybe in the jury room. And that brings more of a collective sort of wisdom about the case that maybe doesn't occur when people are remote. So that is definitely something we're keeping an eye on. I appreciate the question. Sure. And our, uh, our next speaker uh, is, Rebecca Davis. Rebecca is a partner in our Atlanta office whose practice focuses in litigating and counseling on a wide array of environmental matters. Rebecca is also a key member of our ESG team, and she'll be speaking uh, this year regarding the ESG forecast. Sean. Um, as Sean mentioned, I'm Rebecca Davis, and I am part of CIFARTH's ESG team. ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance, is a hot topic for a lot of reasons right now and from a lot of standpoints. Uh, companies, either through their own initiatives or through pressure from stakeholders or regulators, are becoming increasingly committed to changes that will benefit both the environment and society and that will increase their public image. And so with these increased commitments, especially in conjunction with increased regulation, we expect to see increased risks and increased litigation over the next year. So when we talk about ESG, it's important to keep in mind that there currently is no ESG standard. And indeed, the term ESG is still not yet well-defined. But still, uh, right now, more than 90% of S&P 500 companies are publishing an ESG report of some type. So business partners, consumers, investors, and employees have asked organizations to explain how they are managing their impact on the planet and people. And organizations are already receiving evaluations from third-party ESG raters and rankers. And again, all of this is without standards. So the reporting is not consistent and there are no requirements that it be consistent. So this, of course, also leads companies to making statements about their ESG-related achievements on social media, on their own websites, on product labels, other places. And some of this has been met with scrutiny by investors, consumers, and regulators. So as a result, regulators are taking more action to curtail misleading information. And task forces in the public and even in the private sectors have been developed to address concerns regarding disclosures, ranging from climate to human capital. Both the public and private sectors have started to focus on policies to satisfy stakeholder expectations, even without, again, a well-defined ESG framework and without any consistent metrics. So this only really complicates um, everything and essentially a one-size-fits-all structure is just not, not appropriate across many industries. Also, to confuse things even more as ESG evolves and develops, anti-ESG sentiment is on the rise. 
Uh, recently, we're seeing an increase in anti ESG regulations, typically at the state level in connection with political motivations most frequently. So the end result that we anticipate is that we are going to need ongoing and evolving guidance to minimize risk. Also, although there have been relatively few ESG related private lawsuits and regulatory actions in the past few years, we do expect to see a rise in these actions moving into 2023. So in 2022, we saw historical activity with respect to the SEC. First, the SEC proposed the climate related disclosure rule, which will require all organizations with SEC reporting obligations to disclose certain information about direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions. Second, the SEC proposed a rule requiring registered investment companies and advisors, and in some instances, even unregistered advisors to disclose their ESG strategies in fund prospectuses, brochures, and annual reports. Third, there is a proposed rule designed to curtail greenwashing of fund names, and if passed, it will require a fund to invest 80% of its assets that are consistent with the actual fund name. And it's just, it's not all in the proposed rules when it comes to the SEC either. We also anticipate that the SEC no, sorry, just one more. We anticipate that the SEC will require registrants to disclose their human capital resources to the extent that such disclosures would be material to an understanding of the registrant's business. So we're seeing all kinds of new rules proposed, but we're also seeing enforcement. Under the current lead SEC leadership, there has already been an increase in enforcement. For example, in April 2022, a complaint was filed against a mining company based on misleading social and environmental disclosures. Shortly thereafter, a registered investment advisor was charged for misrepresenting certain ESG related qualities and funds. So as new rules are adopted and as ESG evolves, we do expect to see more enforcement in 2023 and then thereafter as ESG becomes more popular within, a, within the social framework. Next slide, please. We also anticipate more FTC and environmental focused cases. The FTC right now is working on an updated green guide, which was originally issued to help marketers make sure their claims regarding environmental benefits and carbon offsets were true and substantiated. The new update will also likely include information on how to avoid unfair and deceptive practices, but these updates could potentially provide another basis for future claims. On the environmental side, we also anticipate more claims based on greenwashing. Again, think about the green guide as both regulators and consumers focus more on false and inaccurate claims or marketing strategies that don't comply with regulations. And we anticipate that we may see a rise in claims regarding green financing, especially as certain industries are working to get their arms around disclosure obligations. Relatedly, EPA enforcement actions have already increased under the Biden administration, and the Biden administration is putting more money into clean energy initiatives, including renewable energies and EV programs, to push the U.S. towards a net zero country. The Infrastructure Investment in a Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act go a long way towards that goal. But as a result of that new funding through those acts, EPA has a new ability to pursue a cleanup objectives and polluters, and there is also a new focus on environmental justice and equality, which in itself can spawn a whole new tranche of litigation. Next slide, please. So consumer and shareholder cases are also expected to rise, especially as ESG gains traction and the plaintiff's bar learns how to navigate these cases. We've already seen cases filed against companies based on alleged false promises of diversity and inclusion achievements and zero tolerance for sexual harassment. And we expect to see more, including actions filed as derivative actions of private actions based on just common law theories. Cases spawned from the Me Too movement gained traction and attention, and we expect that to continue. Along those same lines, we again expect to see consumer actions, more consumer actions for false advertising, and more consumer protection claims. And finally, ERISA matters may lead to some interesting litigation. Uh, first, in 2022, the Department of Labor announced a final rule that permits planned fiduciaries to consider climate change and ESG factors when selecting their own retirement investments. And there are still some unsettled questions with respect to the Dobbs decision, including 
as to employers who committed to providing travel to employees in states where abortion is now illegal. So it's unclear right now whether benefits impact a risk of preemption and to expose the employer to criminal action in certain states as well. So obviously, next slide, please. I'm sorry, okay. Um, obviously, ESG brings with it increased risk that needs to be managed, and there are ways to do so within the ESG framework. Companies will need to be proactive and recognize the demands of stakeholders and implement effective organizational strategies to address those specific demands. Companies will also need to tailor their approach and not apply a one-size-fits-all strategy. Materiality will also matter. Companies will also need to understand the how and why of their organization and then determine how the ESG factors fit the company itself. Companies will also need to plan and then effectively implement that strategy to match that plan. And then without standardization, companies will need to actually create and affirm their own goals and they will need to establish their own check and balance system for verification and consistency. And it's only after regulations continue to evolve that companies will need to evaluate those goals again. And finally, since ESG is not well defined, companies will need to focus on overall impact, which currently is the planet and the people. I'm sorry, the planet and the people as a means of risk management. And so, in short, there are a lot of moving pieces to all of this, and we expect to see within the next year more evolution, more risk, more enforcement, more litigation, more risk management, and hopefully more definition in the year to come. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Sean. Thanks, Rebecca. And and one thing there might not be more of, uh, so that we could uh, look for the silver lining. I think there's a question on uh, the part of the uh, written forecast that discussed private litigation, and you know, a, as companies uh, make great strides in terms of establishing their ESG priorities, it seems that, and you sort of make the point in the written materials that that there's generally been success in defeating private lawsuits uh, where people try to seize upon these policies, uh, including at the early stages in the motion to dismiss stage. Can you, uh, there's a question if you could elaborate a little bit more on, on those, uh, the dismissal in those cases. That's right, actually. Um, so far, the, the plaintiff's bar is, is not prevailing on these cases, and we're seeing um, more, you know, motions to dismiss granted, um, it, it, at the outset very early and we anticipate um, that that's going to evolve. You know, the, the plan as far as getting smarter, um, the public interest is growing. Um, there is more pressure behind it. We're now seeing regulations that did not exist before. You know, we, we anticipate that even if the SEC rules are not um, adopted as, you know, currently proposed that there will be rules in place and that is going to create an additional basis for for claims. Um, we're going to see, I think, the same thing with the FTC, um, with the green guides. You know, all, all of this is going to, I think, provide a basis for for the plaintiff's bar to, to actually pursue more and more within the courts. And I think we will see some success. And then we have seen uh, claims that are successful with respect to the Me Too movement. So there, there is some traction there. And we have a uh, question going back quickly uh, for Chris Robertson on the trial front. And the, the question is, is social inflation in jury verdicts part of your evaluation of each case? And how do you explain that arbitrary and abstract factor to a client? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Yeah, I responded. Uh, you know, we do consistently evaluate social inflation, which uh, for folks who don't know the term, it's really an insurance term that came up in the last four or five years is sort of a term that's now utilized. And it, it really looks to sort of how the, the trend of jury verdicts is either above or below sort of inflation from a how do we price insurance standpoint, actuarial standpoint. So we do follow it. And I think all of us statistically follow it to figure out where we are with settlements uh, and how to value and price a case. But, you know, we look at it as a trend. It's, Every case is specific to its facts and the law applicable. And so I think while it's a valuable tool as a, as a sort of macro analysis, I think it, it doesn't necessarily uh, overcome the micro analysis of each case. So I think that's typically how we explain it to clients. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next, our consumer class action chair, Christine Argentine, is here to discuss trends and challenges in defending class action. 
Thanks, Sean. Um, so yeah, you know, when we're talking about consumer class actions, obviously that's a wide array of issues. Um, Rebecca mentioned labeling issues and substantiation issues. What we've seen recently is a, a real push towards the privacy issues, um, not just data breach cases, which are still, you know, very active and, and coming, but more in terms of you know, what type of information of consumers is being collected? How is it being used? And what we've seen is the plaintiff's bar has gotten super creative in the way in which they are pursuing those claims. And so one trend we've seen is under the Video Privacy Protection Act. At first that um, those claims, they were targeting kind of online media, news outlets, streaming services, but really those Class actions have been expanded to any websites that have an embedded video that is available for um, users of that website to watch online or through an app. Now, the Video Privacy Protection Act was originally enacted in 1988. So it's an interesting use of this statute because it was originally a very narrow statute intended to basically prevent brick and mortar stores um, that rented videos or sold videos such as Blockbuster from kind of releasing um, the data about its customers viewing preferences or its history. And it actually came about because a judge that was being considered for the Supreme Court, um, his viewing information was released to the public. And, and so this statute was created. Um, but now that statute is being used to basically allege that different um, analytic tools on websites such as pixels that are used to track a website's um, user activity are transferring data for marketing purposes to companies like um, Facebook, right? And it's capturing kind of the video viewing information in that transfer of data. And so the, the plaintiff's bar is basically alleging that's a violation of the Video Privacy Protection Act. Now, there's been a lot of challenges on the motion to dismiss in terms of are these individuals that are visiting the website actually a consumer within the statute's definition? Are websites that simply have embedded videos part, meant to be included in that video service provider definition? But the motions to dismiss have largely been unsuccessful to this point. Um, the courts are just really hesitant because of this kind of novel application of this old statute with this new technology to say that, you know, these cases can be dismissed outright. Now, there is a consent exception within the statute that was added in 2013, um, and there's been a very little discussion in the case law on it, but it seems to be trending that the average privacy policies that websites tend to have that disclose, you know, the use of information to third parties isn't enough. The statute has a very specific consent requirement. Um, and so it has been suggested that that consent needs to be very specific to this statute, which obviously companies couldn't anticipate right before this trend came because no one anticipated that this 1988 statute was going to start being used in modern technology. The, the exposure is really high, though. Right, because this statute is so old and was originally intended for more individual um, disclosures, the exposure is $2,500 per violation, which when you're talking about clicks on a website, obviously can be exponential. The other place that we've seen um, users or plaintiffs bar using older statutes is with the wiretap statutes. And those are similar to the VPPA claims in that the plaintiff's bar is essentially pursuing class actions under state wiretap statutes saying that technology used on company websites such as chat functions or um, just you know, technology to scan a person's movements on a website is actually improperly intercepting and sharing those communications. So we've seen a lot of consumer class actions filed under wiretap statutes alleging, you know, it's a privacy violation to disclose that information to third parties. Again, statutory damages are often pretty high. So it's an attractive statute for class actions, especially when you're talking about visitors to a website. Um, you know, while the privacy policies generally state that information may be shared, the plaintiffs are arguing in general that they're not anticipating that this type of information is going to be shared in this type of way. So, for example, these claims have become particularly prevalent in the healthcare industry, where certain information that you're typing into a website about a medical condition or searching for a particular doctor 
um, is revealing information about you or about a medical condition that then is being transferred and you're getting maybe or consumers are getting um, advertisements about that medical condition. So they're kind of tying it into the healthcare industry saying the super private information is being shared and used in a way that they wouldn't anticipate. So with these types of cases, right, we really encourage companies to understand the technology that they're using and to really understand what is being shared, how is it being shared, um, and what are your uh, options within that technology, right? With respect to certain pixels or cookies, there are certain um, things that you can turn on or turn off that would limit the sharing of information or, or, the, or maybe anonymize the information in a way that would maybe not implicate these statutes directly. Next slide. So other things that we're looking at for 2023, obviously Illinois' Biometric Privacy Act is a big one. Last week, the Illinois Supreme Court came down and said that a five-year statute of limitations, not a one-year statute of limitations, applies to that statute. A lot of cases were being stayed until that decision came down. Obviously, that opens the floodgates and makes that statute even more attractive when you have that greater statute of limitations. We're also waiting for a decision from the Illinois Supreme Court on accrual, the accrual issue. So is the damage accrued the first time the biometric information is collected, or is it a violation every time that biometric information is collected? Obviously, that very much changes the exposure. And so we expect that decision to come down from the Illinois Supreme Court um, probably later this quarter. So depending on how these decisions come down, Obviously, that could open the floodgates in BIPA and also might lead other states to expedite their passage of statutes similar to the Illinois BIPA statute. Um, false advertising and labeling claims, those are expected to continue. Those have been around for a lot. Um, but as Rebecca mentioned, there's kind of a renewed focus or a newer focus on substantiation of the claims. Is what you're saying is organic or locally sourced? Can you substantiate that? And how can you substantiate that? And what does that look like? So some of these guides that are, are coming out are going to help um, kind of dictate what that substantiation should look like and, and maybe develop the plaintiff's bar's arguments where they think substantiation has not been done adequately to put that label on. Um, TCPA is always an issue. We've seen some statutes, though, very recently being passed in other states that are called mini TCPAs, right? Florida, Oklahoma, um, there was one recently passed in Washington, all that have private rights of action. And all of the statutes are more expansive than TCPA and have additional requirements that companies need to pay attention to. Um, to make sure that they are still complying with those statutes as well as the TCPA, you know, and all of those regulations. Because again, the exposure is very high. We're talking about a per call, per text violation. And so you want to make sure that whatever marketing you're doing is in compliance with not just the TCPA, but also if you are sending texts into states like Florida, like Washington, like Oklahoma, that you're in compliance with their statutes as well. So, you know, we, we look at kind of what companies can be doing to be proactive to avoid these consumer class actions. Um, as I mentioned, with the privacy cases, you really want to understand the technology that you're looking at and that you're using and how you're using that technology. With the TCPA, now's a good time to review your marketing um, processes and whether or not you're using automatic telephone dialing systems. You know, under the Florida statute, automatic telephone dialing system is defined a lot more broadly. So what systems are you using? So it's really important to kind of look at your policies and procedures in your marketing um, and make sure that everything is being complied with there. Um, you know, obviously, we can help with all of that and try to help companies be proactive. Um, but, you know, the plaintiff's bar has been aggressive and we expect that they will continue to be aggressive. Turn it back to Sean. Oh, Sean, I think you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Our next speaker is uh, Dawn Merton Knight, and our litigation. She's our litigation co-chair in our Boston office and a partner uh, in our trade secret computer fraud and non-compete group. Dawn is also a frequent speaker and writer on trade secret issues. 
as well as the co-editor of our award-winning Trade Secrets blog, shameless plug. Uh, Don will be telling us what to expect on the trade secret front in the coming year. Thank you, Sean. Um, so despite uh, the trade secret name on that last title, I'm gonna start with restrictive covenants um, because right now that's kind of where a lot of the um, important stuff is happening. Uh, many people may have heard uh, that about a, a month ago, the FTC announced a proposed rule that would ban virtually all non-competes. And this has thrown the business and legal communities uh, into upheaval already in the last month. There are over 5,000 comments um, on the FTC's webpage on this proposed rule. Um, as I said, it would ban virtually all non-competes. There are really only two exceptions. Uh, one exception is you can have a non-compete in the proposed rule. I should be clear, this is just a proposed rule right now. Um, you can have a non-compete in a franchise agreement between a franchisor and franchisee. The second exception is for the sale of a business, but even that exception is extremely, extremely narrow. Um, the seller of the business as drafted in the current proposed rule would need to have at least a 25% stake in the business being sold. So the example that I like to use Imagine a family business where five siblings own the company equally. They each have 20% of the company. They sell for millions, maybe even billions of dollars. None of them under this proposed rule as it is currently drafted could be bound by a non-compete. They could turn around the next day and compete uh, for all the same customers, same sorts of services. So that is obviously very concerning. There are a lot of issues uh, with the proposed rule. I could talk about it for an hour. I have talked about it for an hour. I won't do that right now. Um, the only other thing I will mention about this that is really surprising, I think, to a lot of people is that the proposed rule, again, if it is implemented in the way that it is currently drafted, would apply retroactively. So it's not just going to be, all right, going forward, you can't have a non-compete in these agreements. It's you need to rescind any non-competes, even if as of today, they're reasonable, they are enforceable, they are legal. Now, what's gonna happen with that? As I keep saying, it's a proposed rule. Um, there is a comment period, as I mentioned. Right now, the deadline to comment is March 20th, but there has been a request that that comment period be extended by, by an additional 60 days, which I think is likely to be granted. Um, so then we're looking at May. Uh, the FTC has already received over 5,000 comments on this, some in favor, some against. Um, but I would not be surprised if the F FTC implements a rule that is more limited or edited in some way, given some of the concerns that the business community has had. Then, once that is implemented, there will be probably a 180 day period before it goes into effect. And I can assure you, this is likely going to go up to the Supreme Court particularly in light of last year's decision in the West Virginia versus EPA case, where the Supreme Court really cracked down on administrative agencies' ability to regulate in this way. I, I would be shocked if we don't see a case that goes up to the Supreme Court arguing that the FTC does not have the ability to regulate in this area, particularly where it's been left to the states for centuries. So keep an eye on that. We will obviously be updating you on that as anything happens, but it's not just the FTC. Um, just in the last few days, the Workforce Mobility Act was reintroduced in Congress, and that would also largely ban non-competes with very, very limited exceptions. Uh, no progress has really been made on that yet, but that's something to keep an eye on. And very similarly, you see some state legislatures debating whether to ban non-competes entirely. Currently, there are a few states that um, ban non-competes. Most people know that California, it's very, very difficult to enforce a non-compete. They're only permissible in certain uh, very limited circumstances. There are a couple other states like that as well. And you can see here, there are bills in New York and West Virginia that are currently being debated as to whether to ban non-competes entirely. Now, before we go on to the next slide, again, I just want to reiterate, nothing has happened here, you know, either on the federal level um, or with New York or West Virginia, but that is something that I think we're going to see more and more frequently, states considering whether to ban non-competes entirely. So let's go to the next slide. Speaking of state legislatures and what they are doing, even in states where a proposed ban is not being debated, we have just seen in the last 15 years, and it is continuing today, an absolute explosion of legislative activity uh, in this area. And not just for non-competes, for other restrictive covenants as well, including customer or employee 
non-solicitation provisions. So in January alone, there were more than two dozen bills introduced in 13 different states. Um, between the time that we put these slides together and today, there have probably been more introduced. So it's really, it's just an incredibly hot topic. Um, and there are certain things that we tend to see in these state proposals, which again, some of them get passed, some of them don't. Um, and we've listed here some of the things that we tend to see most frequently um, low wage bans. So what we mean by that is many, many states, a growing number of states now have wage thresholds for restrictive covenants. And again, it's not just non competes. There are at least two states that have wage thresholds for non solicits. And the idea is, let's say in a certain state, anyone who makes less than $100,000 a year can't be bound by a non compete. Um, and again, that's we're seeing that trend over and over again. Notice requirements is another one that we see very frequently. Um, there is a concern that an employee could be ambushed on their first day of a new job and be presented with an agreement that says for a year after you leave this company, you won't compete in certain geographic area. Um, and the idea again is you want the employee to have notice of that before they accept the offer. So many states now have various notice requirements and it varies, you know, by state by state. And this is the case for the low wage bans as well. The wage thresholds are different in the various states as are the notice requirements. Some states have only a three day notice period. Other states have seven days, 14 days. Right to counsel provisions. Those are also um, becoming more popular and they're somewhat related to the notice requirements in these states, which there's uh, Massachusetts and Illinois, I can tell you have these requirements. The employer needs to advise the employee that they have the right to obtain counsel of their own choice to review the document before they sign it. Prohibition on out of state choice of law and venue provisions. The idea here is that the various state legislatures that implement these rules want to protect their residents. So, for example, in Washington state, um, 2020, there is a statute that prohibits a Washington based employee from being bound by a non compete that would require, let's say, New York law to apply or a New York forum for any dispute. Washington state has said for Washington residents, they need to be bound by Washington law because we want them to have the protections of Washington law. I'm going to stick with Washington for a second because that gets us to the next and last bullet point here. Fee shifting and other penalties. Um, Washington has a pretty draconian statute, as do some other states, where if an employer doesn't comply with the relevant law, it's not just that the non-compete is unenforceable, but the employer can be forced to pay fines. They could be forced to pay the employee's um, legal fees or other penalties. So this is a hot topic, something that you really need to stay abreast of because, again, we get another couple of statutes every year that are actually passed, let alone all the various bills that are uh, introduced and debated. And as you can imagine for employers that have uh, employees in multiple states, especially hybrid workers, um, employees who might live in one jurisdiction and commute over state line to another uh, state where their office is, it really gets very, very complicated and it's important to be aware of the various state laws that are implicated. So finally, we can move to the next slide, which this is um, to talk about trade secrets a little bit. Um, we continue to see trade secret theft grow and it costs the US billions of dollars every single year. There are a few reasons uh, for that. Some of the drivers, remote work, it's here to stay. You know, a lot of us are back in the office, but most of us work from home once or twice a week. There are employees who still are 100% remote. That makes it more, uh, there's, there are more opportunities for some of those employees to misappropriate trade secrets. Technological advances. What was possible 15 years ago is very different from what is possible today. I mean, today versus a year ago, even there have been technological advances that make it easier for certain bad actors to take and copy trade secrets. And of course, you know, one other factor we have, you know, foreign actors who are looking to steal trade secrets, not only from the government, but private employers as well. One other trend we are seeing in this area is just some eye popping verdicts in misappropriation cases. Um, last year, we saw some verdicts of, you know, tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars in one case. Um, and one of the, uh, 
things that we are seeing in that area, there's a relatively new damages theory for these sorts of cases called the avoided costs theory. And rather than just looking at what the owner of a trade secret has lost due to misappropriation, it looks at the windfall that the misappropriator has gained in the sense of that person was able to avoid all of the costs associated with some technological advance, for example. So they didn't have to pay for research and development, the innovation costs, they were able to avoid all those costs simply by misappropriating somebody else's trade secret. So that's one of the reasons we are seeing these really, really significant um, damages awards. Finally, the last thing I'll leave you with, because I know we're running short on time, um, we are seeing more and more companies because of this, because of the increased opportunities for bad actors to misappropriate trade secrets, we are seeing an increased focus on identifying and protecting those trade secrets, which is absolutely critical. If a company is in a position where they need to file a lawsuit for trade secret misappropriation, it is immensely difficult if they have not done some legwork in advance to identify with particularity what their trade secret is, where it is stored, who has access to it, why it's valuable, and so on and so forth. And so one of the things that we always recommend is for companies to do a trade secret audit that helps them do some of that legwork up front. So if they have to run into court one day to say, a former employee took this information, we have all that information that we can easily put into our pleadings and convince a judge, this is actually a trade secret and you really need to take this seriously. So with that, I will, Hand it back to Sean. Thank you, Don. And it is really is, and I know uh, it separately uh, is part of an hour long session, right? For everything that uh, you had to cover. So, thanks for giving us the cliff notes uh, today. So, finally, uh, here to address the 2023 uh, outlook on innovation and e-discovery, we have the national deputy chair of our e-discovery and information governance group, Jake Carl. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, so, the first trend I really want to um, share with you today is, is something that we've actually been monitoring for some time, and that is the continuing growth of the use of collaboration platform and kind of off-channel communications, I guess I'll, I'll call them. Now, you know, the, the rise of collaboration platforms actually started before the pandemic, got a shot of adrenaline during the pandemic, but we've really seen adoption of these platforms continue to grow. Um, you know, and it presents a number of different kinds of issues, but these are, these are the Teams chats, the Teams channels, Slack, Confluence, Monday.com. There's really been a market explosion of different kinds of collaboration platforms that are available out there. And as organizations push their teams to innovate and to grow, to be more adaptive, be more fluid, um, you know, work faster, work smarter, um, you know, many organizations have looked to these tools to enable that kind of uh, that work. Um, so, you know, we, we've seen trends where, in some respects, um, you know, certain business units might be spending more time in those collaboration platforms than they are in front of their email platform, where it used to be that you would come into the office and fire up email and check your day, and instead of doing that, they're firing up their collaboration platform, and that's their primary area of work uh, where they're doing stuff. Um, so it's important to kind of be aware of the issues that this uh, presents with respect to electronic discovery, uh, discovery obligations and litigations, investigations, whether that's an outside entity that's doing a governmental investigation, internal investigations, it raises a number of issues. The important, the most important thing is just to be aware of those issues so that you can plan and adapt, um, you know, for them. and 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 try to execute um, uh, some control over that information so that it doesn't come back and present risk for you in a litigation or an investigation later. You know, some of these issues that we see are really that, um, you know, the, these platforms push, push our concept of what we all really traditionally kind of understand as a document. Um, these, these platforms are not traditional documents or nice formatted emails with attachments necessarily. Rather, they're kind of ongoing conversations over time. A chat communication may start up and last for months or years, um, you might have different channels or groups of chats, right? So if you've identified several key people uh, within an investigation or litigation, you might, they might have certain one-to-one -one chat communications, but they may also be a member of a number of different groups that have channels or Teams channels set up that you also kind of need to think about, well, which, which members 
uh, what are they members of? And do we care about what those groups are, right? And for, on the back end, all that information is kind of stored separately, right? So identifying an individual and preserving their kind of chat communications within a platform doesn't necessarily get you the whole way. Um, so that's important to think about those, what that actually means to us uh, as lawyers and litigators um, and, you know, running our organizations in terms of how we actually try to govern this information and deal with it when it comes up in litigation. How do we preserve it, collect it? Um, you know, also kind of pushing the boundaries of, of documents is that it's not only just the ongoing conversations instead of a nicely formatted packaged document, is that it, it's not just chat. It might be comments with respect to inline comments with respect to documents kind of like track changes in a document, but this time inside of a collaboration platform, kind of stored separately than the document itself. So it's not gonna be relevant in every single situation, uh, but it certainly could be. And so it's, it's just important to kind of be aware of how these collaboration platforms work, how people use them, where the information is stored within them, um, you know, so that you can identify that and potentially tease it out if necessary when conducting an investigation for litigation. Um, you know, oftentimes these, these uh, it, it comes as a surprise to law departments, um, but it really shouldn't be. And, and more and more, uh, you know, courts are starting to recognize these platforms in discovery disputes and sanctioning parties for failure to preserve or to produce them, right? Um, a related trend um, that we're also seeing in addition to the use of collaboration platforms is kind of off-channel communications. So we might see, you know, the workforces are becoming more and more savvy, you know, and they may flip to from an email communication to a chat communication, you know, over to a signal chat, uh, WhatsApp communication, or a regular chat. Um, you know, so again, it's not every single matter that you need to be concerned about text messages, signal communications, telegram, or WhatsApp, but it is important, important to kind of be aware and, and recognize that from a practical perspective, it probably is happening um, in some respects. So, you know, the, the solution is not to ignore it, but the solution is just to be aware of it and kind of adapt. We call it information governance for a reason, and that is you never really have control of, of information. It's a constant battle to kind of govern information and be aware of it. So, you know, some solutions to be able to tackle these problems, I think, are really twofold. And one is, you know, to, to um, proactively approach information governance issues to make sure that legal has a seat at the table, not to stifle innovation on how teams work, but to kind of understand how teams are working and to help the business areas and information technology professionals be aware of what legal requirements are gonna be imposed on them um, if an investigation or a litigation arises or a legal hold. Um, you know, to, to be forward thinking about the information in the organization and to start thinking about, if you haven't already, um, certain kinds of retention policies, right, that may, in the absence of a duty to preserve information for litigation and regulatory compliance, result in the purging of that information that is no longer of any business value to the organization, can significantly reduce risks in litigation if you know, uh, historical information that is no longer relevant to the business just doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, the, uh, outside of the information governance policy realm, there's just making sure that we do our homework up front to kind of understand the scope of the litigation, the people who are involved, and take some time up front to do those interviews, to do that investigation and to lay the groundwork to kind of understand what are the sources of information that you're potentially going to be on the hook to deal with in a litigation matter or an investigation. Um, you know, it's not every case that is gonna have collaboration platform data or text messages. But if you do that investigation and you come to that conclusion, right, document that. What did you do that is reasonable? We're finding that litigants are really being caught between the crosshairs in, an, in, un, in uncomfortable situations when that early investigation was not done. And they just assumed this was an email case and not a, collab, and not a collaboration platform case, where we're seeing email communications that say, hey, let's switch to text. 
right? Or chat communications that say, hey, let's switch to Signal. Um, or, hey, join me in the Teams chat, right? So, things like that, where we're finding that being produced in information which is coming back to haunt litigants later. So that early investigation is really important. Next slide, please. Um, the next trend I really want to talk about is innovations in e-discovery technology. And I just want to take a quick step back here in kind of e-discovery history, and that is initially when e-discovery became a thing, it was because there were these huge sanctions cases about people failing to preserve, you know, organizations failing to preserve. Sanctions is still a thing, right, but that was what kick-started it. Um, and then it became about cost because e-discovery is so expensive. Costs have drastically come down as the market has kind of expanded. There's a variety of different solutions out there. Um, and so costs really have started to become under control. People understand the costs of discovery now. And so we're really seeing a focus of this, this technology being matured to the, to the standpoint where we can really leverage it to extract value of the discovery process. What is the purpose of discovery originally? It's really to find facts to marry them to the law to make legal arguments, right? To tell a story, a narrative. It's hard to do that when you've got millions of documents that you've got to get through. So it's not, it, it's starting to be not so much about just getting through the process defensively um, and efficiently, but really making sure that we extract value from that process. And we leverage predictive coding and active learning to be able to do that. There are some really cool tools on the market now that allow for sentiment analysis that, um, without getting into the details, allow attorneys to kind of search for information that shows certain kinds of emotion, outrage, surprise, um, you know, uh, different ways to kind of search information to give you a jump start, a, a key insight to find important information um, and train uh, the active learning process, for instance. Um, there have been improvements in conceptual analyst, uh, analysis that will give you analyze the data and give you topics that you can drill into, communication pattern analysis, and really importantly, integrated fact management capabilities within review platforms where attorneys can, in real time, when they find key information, make notes about that, put it in a certain folder or link it to a deposition that's going to be uh, done later, or identify it as a key information that might be good for a, a substantive pleading. And in that respect, later on, it becomes much more efficient to be able to leverage the information gained during a review and move that value forward into the litigation during depositions and, and pleadings much more efficiently. Carry that story forward, build a narrative for your case from the very beginning, instead of just going through the motions to get through this discovery process. So in that respect, with these innovations, you know, um, Clients can really expect more from their counsel, from their in-house teams, um, who, who leverage these technologies and expertise to, to be able to make use of them. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Jay. I want to provide everybody with the uh, CLE code for today's program, which is SS4645. Uh, it's on the screen as well, SS4645. I also invite uh, all participants to uh, feel free to reach out via, via email or phone. All that information is on our website with respect to any of the speakers if you have direct follow-up questions, uh, and also to stay tuned for uh, uh, mailings in connection with Parts 2 and 3 of our Commercial Lit Outlook 2023. Thank you again. Thank you.